Yes, I'm still here, Hollywood. And coming up on today's episode... Has there ever been talk about doing a reboot with ER? Well... Uh Uh-oh, I think I've stumbled onto something. Yeah, you know, this has not been talked about. A lot of uh, people who were in the cast and associated with the program spun off into other things. Perhaps most notably, George Clooney. He likes to play practical jokes on people. Did he ever do anything like that to you? Well, I... uh, He's a jokester. I sort of of pegged him early as as one to watch (laughs) and uh, made sure that I was more of an accomplice than a victim. And that's best served by not leaving the table first. Whoever leaves the table first, inevitably George will go, you know what we should do. (laughs) (laughs) Medical dramas on television have been around pretty much since the advent of the picture tube. There was Dr. Kildare in the 1960s, Marcus Welby, MD, in the 70s, St. Elsewhere was in the 80s, but starting in the 90s, there was one team of diligent doctors that stitched their way to critical acclaim and 23 Emmy Awards. It also propelled its actors to true stardom. There was even a future Batman hidden in the scrubs. This is Still Here Hollywood. I'm Steve Kometko. Join me with today's guest, Dr. Carter from ER, Noah Wiley. Noah, thanks for doing this for me. I really appreciate it. My nice pleasure. to have you Thank here. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, one of the things I'd like to start out with, you're one of the few people who actually was born here in Hollywood. True. And grew up here. True. Now, you have nothing else to compare it to, but how do you think that helped you or hurt you in terms of your career choice? Uh I think it helped in a lot of ways, not the least of which was the fact that my whole family, friends, support group, and history was here, whereas most people that come here to pursue their dreams are coming from somewhere else, and this is not the most welcoming city to move to. It's not the easiest to navigate. It's not the easiest to make friends because it's so spread out. So I've always thought it was a great advantage that you know my base was here already. Uh, also, you know, exposure, just that 10,000 hours of exposure earlier than everybody else. My stepfather works in the industry and he's done everything from, he was Frank Sinatra's coffee boy on Manchurian Candidate. Wow. And then he ended up running studios in the 80s. Um, but I was, I grew up on sets and I grew up with enough proximity to it that it seemed like it was a feasible goal. Unlike a lot of people who think, I don't even know what that roadmap would look like. It, for me, it was a left on Fairfax. You know? <laughs> uh, also, because of your exposure, I think a lot of people come here who are hoping to make their name. They don't know, you know, a set can be a very intimidating place the first, place, first time you're on it or if you're going for an audition. You had that as well going for you, that you had at least some feel for. Yeah, but I feel like, you know, uh, the second I stepped on a set, I just felt that I was exactly where I wanted to be. I, I see black cables on floors and I follow them to lights that have flags next to them and I find a camera and a bunch of guys in shorts and my heart starts beating. Because I, that's the one environment in the world where I know where north is and south is and east and west. I know where I go. I know where it, I know, I know, I know that world very well. It's the, everything else that confuses me. And I felt that element of magic and kind of behind the scenes at the circus and wanted to figure out how these guys were doing the stuff that everybody else was on the, on the receiving end of, you know. I was taken with it. Do you remember the first time you uh, had that kind of an experience? What kind of a rush you got? I grew up in Hollywood in the hills, uh, a little bit up from a park called Waddles Park, which back in the late 70s, early 80s, became a popular uh, location spot to shoot kind of B to C minus cable skin flick movies. So I would go down and watch them film from the trees (laughs) and just... You know, watch them do it over and over again. And sometimes I'd see actors I recognize from movies, and it'd be fascinating to watch them just being casual or rehearsing a fight scene. I just, I, yeah, junkie. You um, went to Northwestern, right? I was invited to attend a theater program that Northwestern sponsors for juniors of, in high school, which I did after my junior year, 1988. And that was a very seminal summer and since I came out of that thinking this is what I want to do I did my senior year graduated didn't go to college started acting right out of of school living with a guy that I met at that program but we applied to college and 
were accepted and never attended. Do you regret that? Not at all. I only regret it when I think about how I, I've never given myself four years to do nothing except explore interests with very little responsibility and lots of resources. I've only kind of been, you know, fortunate to keep working, but working since I was, you know, young. And uh, it would be, I've, I've thought about it after the fact, thinking that would be nice to take a sabbatical and do a deep dive kind of study about something that interests me. Do you regret it when you watch Jeopardy? <laughs> no, I did Jeopardy. I did Celebrity Jeopardy, and I did all right. Oh, good for you. Yeah, no, I'm with uh, my, my I'm, I've been called an autodidact. I took my inferiority complex about not going to college and applied it by trying to be smarter than college guys. Did you find it hard getting into the business when you wanted to? From what I've read, it seems as though it was a pretty smooth path for you. Yes, comparatively, absolutely. Um, I was very fortunate and have I've had a lot of angels that have come in and anointed me at, at, at key moments. Uh, the first one was a casting director, uh, legendary casting director named Gretchen Rennell, who um, was out here in California at a party and my parents dragged me to for some friends of theirs and I was sitting and sulking in the corner and she kind of took an interest and asked me what I was interested in doing and I told her I wanted to be an actor and she was, you know, Wonderful. She would invite me. She was head of casting at Disney at the time, so she would bring me in for auditions. She recommended my first agent to me. You know, I just would find myself supported by some incredible person. Oh, I've been very lucky. I read something. I didn't mean to, I meant to write it down, but I didn't. One second. Give me a give me a second here. It was a quote of yours that I wanted to this use. This is so much easier than Stephen Weber said it was going to be. Just kidding. <laughs> I like Stephen a lot. He's a brother. He's, He's a, a good, good man. guest. He was a good guest, too. He's funny. Yeah, he is. Um, it was a quote attributed to you. Uh, it's weird. I actually like doing interviews now. <laughs> Ever since I gave up therapy, it's my only time with a captive audience. I can identify the year that that quotation is from because I gave up therapy very briefly. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're back? Of course. Of course. Uh yeah, you know. Okay, captive audience, spill it. This is a very rare thing, you know. This doesn't happen very often anymore, as you well know, because you watch the whole era where the one-on-one -on -one interview became completely chopped up into micro bites, and now we live in, in an age where everything is pulled out of context. So, you know, in the beginning, when it used to be really nice to be able to talk about your work and be expansive in your answers, and um, I think that's what I meant is that it felt therapeutic to, uh, to talk through what it was like to be on this insanely popular show that changed everybody's lives that was part of it. You know, um, it was a heady time. Tell me what you remember from that. Everything. From ER beginning. Everything. Chap I mean, I remember everything. And then you were on it for like, what, 11 years? It ran 15. I ran 13. Uh, and I did, I did the first 11 seasons. I did few episodes of the 12th, took 13 and 14 off, and came back and did that last half of the 15th and final. Give me an idea of what you remember as especially um, something you really clutch on to. You know, I remember my audition very well. I remember the finale very well. I remember... Um, my One of my favorite memories when we'd shot the pilot and it was very speculative about whether it was going to be even on or successful. Chicago Hope was, was debuting at the same time on CBS, had a much more established cast and David Kelly at the helm. And our reputation was that it was dark, it was difficult to follow and highly technical. And so, and we had this two hour pilot that we were launching with. And they brought us to New York for the, for the upfronts uh, to go out and meet the advertisers. And they showed a clip of the pilot first and we were at Avery Fisher Hall which was packed so there were thousands of people in there and they had George, Sherry, Tony, Eric and I. Juliana hadn't been cast as a, a main character yet because she died in the pilot originally and we're in the wings of Avery Fisher Hall and we hear this voice say you know it says on the screen if you thought there were no more heroes left in the world and then it just started showing these clips from the pilot just boom 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 and we had never seen a frame of it yet so we're watching it kind of sideways and then it stopped and there was silence and then the place went crazy like 
clapping, cheering, stomping, like, and we all got this rush. And I just remember Tony turning to all of us and going, here we go. And we walked out on the stage and we took our little bows, having no idea what the reception was going to be. But it was, you know, astronomical from the very moment we came on the air. It was the most popular show on television for a while. For about a decade, yep. And a lot of uh, people who were in the cast and associated with the program spun off into other things. Perhaps most notably, George Clooney. Yes, Mr. Clooney's done quite well for himself. Yes, he has. Um, Liquor business, I believe. <laughs> among other things. Uh, he likes to play practical jokes on people. Did he ever do anything like that to you? Well, I... Uh, He's a jokester. I sort of, I sort of pegged him early as, as one to watch <laughs> and uh, made sure that I was more of an accomplice than a victim. And the, that's best served by not leaving the table first. Whoever leaves the table first, inevitably George would go, you know what we should do? <laughs> <laughs> so even if you have to use the bathroom, you hold it. You hold it, hold it, hold it until somebody else gets up. He uh, had a little bit of experience himself um, getting into television. I remember I mentioned to you that I used to see him at the Hollywood YMCA all the time. And uh, I think it was uh, when he was doing ER. And... Uh, we used to talk a lot because I was in TV news. His father, Nick Clooney, was an anchor man here in town. Yep. And George has, is a real news addict. Yes, he is. Um, what was that uh, movie? Good, he good made? luck. That's it. Yeah, he has a good grasp of current events, and he has good good opinions about it too. But at least he came into it, you know, having watched his father, having assisted his father in some newsrooms. He's a guy that continually impresses me because he continually redefines what my my assumptions about his talent level are. You know, when we worked together and he was acting, I thought he was a perfectly fine, good actor. But Good Night and Good Luck was another level. You know, writing and directing and starring in that movie was such an homage to his father and the newsman of the past. And in between that, he'd done Dust Till Dawn and One Fine Day. But, you know, he was doing, he was very strategic and extremely thoughtful about how he plotted his course. But he just delivered every single time. And then, you know, Michael Clayton, another one, or Oh Brother, we're out there, another one. He just kept growing. Now he's, you know, humanitarian. He's doing, you know, he's, he walks with kings. A father? A father. That was the one I did not see coming. <laughs> no. He also made that documentary about the Kennedy assassination, which was fascinating. And, uh, and, and Walter Cronkite, um, his participation and how CBS made We the... got to meet Walter Cronkite. Walter Cronkite did the cold open for the live TV movie that you referenced earlier, Failsafe. Um, he came on and, and announced it and talked a little bit about the context of the Cold War and how the writers of Failsafe had been blacklisted writers who had not been able to be credited uh, on uh, his show when they wrote for him. And so he rectified that. It was very cool. Speaking of that, I... I worked at CBS in CBS News, and uh, there was a day when Walter came to the newsroom to talk with one of his old friends who was working for us, Bill Stout, who was a real solid newsman and reported from Vietnam and had a real his rich history, and Walter had come to see him. And um, I worked in a, a very small office, shared it with Stout and some other people who were uh, in that office. And one of the few places there was a chair was next to my desk. And I was in editing. It was deadline. And I walked in and I bumped into the chair and looked down and it was Walter Cronkite was sitting in it. And I said, I'm sorry, I'm on deadline. <laughs> uh, and he looked at me like, yeah, I know what a deadline is, you know. <laughs> like, duh, Steve. Hmm. Most trusted man in America, and you're bumping into him. Um, That's funny. Let's see. Uh, hey, do you do you remember, out of curiosity, any of the medical terms? Oh my God! Are you kidding? You're going to test me with my monologue? No. Well, it's my party trick. Sixty-five-year-old male with severe peripheral vascular disease manifested by claudication of the left calf ten days post-op from Mercy General after having an aorta by femoral bypass. Normal post-operative course till about six hours ago when he began to experience the gradual onset of lower left quadrant pain without palliative or provoking factors. BP 120 over 80, pulse 112, respiration 78. Upon auscultation, diminished breath sounds were noted at the base of the patient's right lung. Intrigued, I tested vocal preminence per second edition, leading me to a diagnosis of pleural effusion confirmed by the 
this radiograph which shows fluid in the patient's right costophrenic sulcus. Very good. I didn't understand a word of it. Well, little bits and he's pieces here and there. He's got a little thing right here. You know, it's a fancy <laughs> way of saying he's got a little thing right here. Your mother was a nurse, right? Uh, orthopedic nurse? Yes. Did 10 years she, OR, 10 years orthopedics. Did she uh, ever give you any advice about your work? Advice? Or how criticism, to approach something? Advice, criticism, it's a fine line sometimes, isn't it? Um, no, she would call at 1101 and say, You never touch your face with bloody gloves. What, do you want to get AIDS? <laughs> I've got to go to the hospital tomorrow and answer for that. And I'd say, okay, okay, point taken. That's cool. <laughs> At least she had an interest. She a had vested a, interest. Yeah, yeah, vested interest. She was, uh, uh, yeah, she because you know she would know what was coming up on the storyline, so she was very in the know. Yep. Is it true that you once had to give a dog mouth to mouth? Only because Mr. Spielberg demanded it be done he uh, took an interest in our show in the first season he was executive producer and uh, shared an anecdote about how when he was a teenager he worked in an emergency room in phoenix and had seen <laughs> some physicians stop what they were doing and give mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation to a german shepherd and save its life thought it would be fun to do on the show and i drew the short straw and that was that <laughs> sucking on snout for a couple of hours well, interesting. But I suppose when Spielberg says, <laughs> do Jump. it. How high? <laughs> yeah, how high, exactly. Um, I also understand that at one point you had to use your, some of your skills, some of the things you picked up along the way in a real emergency, real life emergency. Hmm. What are you fishing for here, Kometko? Let me think. Mostly you learn enough to know how little you know and how much you could do wrong and how you could really make a huge mistake. So a lot of the times, a lot of the times, there's been a few times where I've been, happened to have been the first on scene in an accident, car accident twice. And I, you know, knew enough to be, you know, helpful and supportive and uh, didn't do anything that caused any harm. But it was very funny when the, paramedics show up you know no, I, this woman you know i'm starting to tell them what happened it's like right thing wait what what oh whoa whoa oh yeah we gotta fake that yeah were there ever instances where that's a bit that won't work on the radio portion of this show <laughs> <laughs> there that was a very physicalized bit was the, are there were there instances where people in public members of the public came up to you recognized you as sure a doctor. You, you know, it's the most convenient icebreaker. Say, hey, hey, can you take a look at, you know. Um, there was a period of time where I was so into the medicine that I, I really did feel like I had a pretty on par education with the third year medical student after all the stuff that we had done over the years. But most of it's left me, sadly. Uh, you have three children, correct? Mm -hmm. And you just celebrated your 10th wedding anniversary? I did. I That's did. very nice. It's June nice 7th? That, you just gave it more acknowledgement than we did. <laughs> <laughs> no, wait a minute. I saw something posted on Instagram. Oh, yeah. So That's the coin of the realm in the world today. Hey, you and your wife dancing, I believe. Uh, yes, we dance. That uh, was nice. We've been dancing for 10 years love, and having a lovely time. I uh, read about you and you're listed as actor, producer, director, writer. Which do you identify most with? Gemini. I think that's in there. Angelino's also in there. Um, uh, you know, I, it, I, like I said, I've been very, very fortunate. And a lot of that fortune has come from when I've hit a wall with one of my trajectories. I've been able to pivot and find an interesting new door to explore. And so when I was doing a show up in Canada called Falling Skies, which was also a Spielberg show, kind of a sci-fi show, um, I had all, I always have had directing aspirations, but put it on an extremely high pedestal and thought you have to know so much before you try. You should know music and photography and acting and editing and all the different aspects. And I knew a lot of the production aspects, but I didn't feel like I knew anything about post-production at all. And we had a director fall out of the rotation and the cast promoted me to take the slot, which was extremely gratifying and they approved me and so even though I was in the show a lot I made that was my directorial debut and again I just 
I was terrified, but I never felt that engaged before. Never felt that challenged, never felt that scared or oddly competent. And it just was like a rush I have never had uh, anywhere else. And then I started another show called The Librarians. And so I really wanted to direct on that as well. And I, I, I did. And then I just started thinking, God, I would love to take a crack at writing one of these. And so in the third season, uh, I wrote one and it turned out really, really well. And then the fourth season, I wrote another one and that turned out really well. And, um, and then I got on this other show, Leverage, down in New Orleans, which I also got to direct on. And I wrote one of those, too. And so it's been this nice sort of, you know, ability to kind of sh shift and try different things and storytell in different forms, but ultimately it's all storytelling. And I don't know that I have a preference because I really enjoy them all. And we'll be right back. Is your daughter a Swifty? My youngest, yeah, they've all worked through their Swifties. Their, uh, but my youngest, yeah, we watched, we didn't go to the concert, but we watched the, uh, the movie concert and she, uh, she was into it. She liked it. I like it, you know, put it on the car. And the kids have long been dropped off at school and I'm still playing and, you know, I'm not reaching to change it. It's, it works. On the job training, I think, can almost be more valuable than an education, in a formal education 100%. in school. 100%. And I, I've always felt that if I'm doing something that I've learned on the job, uh, there are people who are watching me and approve of what I'm doing. It's that much more gratifying. Do you feel that's, that's I true? I do. You know, I, you strike me because you've referenced the newsmen of the past as, uh, with reverence that you, you have to have the sensibility to come in and want to learn from the people around you and appreciate that you're standing on shoulders of giants and that, you know, like medicine, the more you learn, the more you learn that there is to learn. And, and so I've always had a real humility about the way I approach it and a real desire to learn as much as I can. And so I ask a lot of questions. And if anybody looks like they're good at their job, I want to see how and why they're doing it so well. Um, does that answer your question? I don't yeah. think it did. Yeah. Tell me, then, who do you think you've learned the most from? Well, Clooney helped, you know, Clooney was very influential because he was one of the guys, you know, he took me under his wing and... It kind of taught me how to be famous in a healthy way and kind of taught me how to be uh, careful and strategic and, and take a long view of my career. And, um, you know, he had a great expression, take your work seriously, but don't take yourself seriously. Um, but I've had a lot of mentors and people that I consider... Um, unfortunately, he passed away last year, but David Crosby, oddly enough, was a real brother. We spent a tremendous amount of time together. Um, and there's a guy that had, that cat had more than nine lives and was generous enough to share uh, all the peaks and valleys of them with me. So I, I find that that is kind of what's kept me on an even keel is seeking out people that have traveled this road before and asking how they did it. Do you think he helped you in any way musically that we don't know about? Well, he did you have musical I aspirations? Up, he got courage to sing in front of him once, and he, without hesitation, told me not to quit my day job. <laughs> well, you need candor every once in a while. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. Um, I also liked the fact when I was reading about it that when you did finally decide to leave ER, uh, it was for your family. Yeah, and. Uh, stepping aside to allow the younger generation to have their opportunity. That sounds a tad more magnanimous than I probably was at the time. I think it was more selfish about wanting either a break or wanting to be at home with my son who was newly born. Uh, and that was really it. You know, he was born in the 11th season and it was the first time that I ever looked at my watch and thought, you know, come on, what are we doing? We're wasting, like, I, and I thought, well, wow, where do you want to be? And it just, I did not want to spend 80 hours a week missing the first couple of years of his life. And uh, I have zero regrets about that. Um, yeah, yeah, family's important. It's the best, actually. Does ER seem as long ago as it was? Some days. You know, for a long time it didn't. And then in the last couple of years it, it did. Because it, it had this really nice resurgence of relevancy during the pandemic you know at, at that during the pandemic it went on hulu for the first time and suddenly people could could stream it and binge it you know without commercials 
and they had the time <laughs> and uh so and there were 15 seasons of of content so during the pandemic and soon thereafter i w was getting a lot of of mail that was making it feel relevant again to me um, especially from first responders and people in the medical field i'm given to reflection every once in a while shame I've, on you i've reached an age where reflection happens a lot do you ever reflect about your career at this point yeah constantly yeah, I'm very happy with where I'm at right now. I'm about to um, start this new venture with this uh, with this old group, and um, I couldn't be more excited about it. It's kind of a culmination of a lot of the stuff that we've been talking about that have been my interests uh, the last few years, and uh, it's a bit of a homecoming. Um, it's it's not really premature to talk about it because it's certainly we we'll start shooting in three weeks, but. Um, which is insane. Uh, I'm doing this new show called The Pit, which is a hospital show. Again, it's going to be on Max. It's going to be on Max. Uh, it's a John Wells show. John executive produced ER. And it is also executive produced by Scott Gemmel, who was an ER writer and producer, and uh, Dr. Joseph Sachs, who was an ER writer and producer. And uh, we've got this really interesting idea on how to do a new medical show. And Max is giving us a chance to do it. We're gonna shoot it around the corner at Warner Brothers, just a stone's throw from where the old one took place. And uh, it's, uh, it's pretty cool. Do you feel like you have enough energy, the same amount of energy that you had at the beginning? I have more. <laughs> really? I have more, yeah. I don't sleep very, I don't need as much sleep as I used to. I think about when I was in my 20s and 30s, sleeping till you know, noon or one o'clock in the afternoon. I've had two days already by noon, you know. I've, I, I'm, just a busy person. There was something else I wanted to ask you about, that I, a quote that I loved. Ask me that question again in February when we wrap this season. I think I'm going to be, I think this one's going to take a lot out of me. I think I'm going to be tired after this one. Really? How it, come? It's going to be an More responsibility? Um, yeah, I wrote two of them, uh, which was extremely gratifying for the first season of a Mac show to get an opportunity to write two of them. You know, there's, I'm going to be in a lot of it, and uh, there's some aspects to it that are going to be extremely challenging. One of the things that uh, I uh, was attributed to you, I'm thinking about naming my first son Emmy. <laughs> Jesus, you're pulling some old stuff. So, <laughs> so I can, I'm an old guy. So, so I, I can, can say, say that I have an Emmy. I've got one. Yes. I want Emmy, Oscar, and Tony, and my daughter, Grammy. <laughs> but I, you didn't do that. I feel like that was an interview that I did drinking <laughs> uh for like a esquire interview or something it was just i was it was in my unguarded phase where i was just spouting off but yeah i did not name any of my children after after acting trophies um so i still cannot claim that i have an emmy an oscar a tony or a grammy but you do have a tattoo i've got a couple from my children my son owen was born as we discussed in 2002 and uh, this is an O for Owen. Then my daughter Auden was born in 2005, and this is uh, for her. And then my daughter Frances uh, and my wife. So they all have, and this is nine dots that my friend Harry Pallenberg put on me at a party when I told him I wanted, a, it was a stick and poke tattoo <laughs> of, uh, remember the show The Saint with Roger Moore? Yes. Remember that white stick figure with the yes. halo? That's what I wanted him to put on me. And then I chickened out nine dots into it. I stopped. Just nine dots yep. into it? That's it. Um, That's all I got. Well, there's always, there's always time. Yeah, no, Harry's still around. <laughs> <laughs> Is your daughter a Swifty? My youngest, yeah, they've all worked through their Swifties. Their, uh, but my youngest, yeah, we watched. We didn't go to the concert, but we watched the uh, the movie concert, and she, uh, she was into it. She liked it. I like it. You know, put it on the car, and the kids have long been dropped off at school, and I'm still playing. And you know, I'm not reaching to change it. It's, it works. What do you do for fun? Mm, that's a good question. Or is life just fun for you? You know, I get a huge charge out of my work. And uh, there were two things that happened. The first was the pandemic when I wasn't working. And, uh, and I didn't feel good about myself because I didn't feel like I had any skills that were really of value during that period of time. It really bothered me a lot that I wasn't contributing 
in any meaningful way. Which is where this idea for this show that I'm doing now kind of came from. It was a desire to put the spotlight back on to people that are on the front lines who have been there care, you know, taking care of us for the last five years without a break. And they're tired and they're burned out and they're overwhelmed. And in a lot of cases, they're being abused. And uh, they're heroes. And I wanted to do something that reflected that again. The second thing was the strike, you know, 192 days of walking around with a picket sign in my hand thinking about, you know, what I think is important and what I think is fair, how I want to work, how, you know, it should work. Uh, it was really poignant. And I no longer take work for granted because those two things showed the fragility of how this whole thing is operating. And it's not a guarantee to any of us. And during the pandemic and just afterwards, after the strike, what I really saw was when I go to work, I'm helping to employ upwards of 300 people so that they can feed their families in really uncertain times. It stopped being about making art and started about making a living and having a place to go to be communal and creative when that didn't seem like it was going to be possible. So I have a, I, I'm coming from a way different place than I used to be. I just can't wait to get to work. I can't wait to help a bunch of different people buy into a singular vision and create something that hopefully would be entertaining or special and then go home to my family. You know, that's a good life for me. Has there ever been talk, just curious, curious uh, about doing a reboot with ER? Well... Uh-oh, so, I think I've stumbled onto something. Yeah, I, you know, this has not been talked about but that's kind of the road we had started down in 2020 i was getting all this mail from first responders and i had this desire to pivot the compliments to john wells so i emailed him and i said hey i'm getting all this this lovely um sort of mail from people that are thanking us for keeping them entertained or inspire them to go into the careers that they're in in the first place and i just have to say thank you that without except for my children, this is probably the best thing I've ever done with my life, and um, I just want to say thanks. And then I went on, and I said, I know you don't want to reboot the show. I don't either. I thought it was very smart not to franchise it and to dilute what we did. But if you ever wanted to do something much smaller and much sort of more contained, more of a character piece, kind of catching up to an old character and just finding out how they feel about what's happening right now in healthcare, kind of use them as a Jeremiah opportunity to say what you want. I would vote for that. I would be on board for that. And he thought about it, and we talked about it, and then we ended up bringing in a couple of the E old ER writers, Scott Gemmel and David Zabel. We talked about it. And um, we came up with a concept, and it really never got out of the starting gate. Uh, we had some issues with uh, the Crichton estate, and the negotiations became um, a non-starter. So in a lot of ways... It was a dodge bullet and a blessing because that would have been the focus. It would have been on, hey, it's the brand again, and who's coming back to play, and oh my God, he looks great, and oh my, you know. Uh, and I really want the focus to be on 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 the content of what we're trying to put across. And so I think this will be a, a, a pure delivery system in a lot of ways than it would have been if we had done the reboot. But we came close. How tall are you? Six one. Oh. Just curious. Um, strange question. Not at all. Six one, brown or brown, Gemini. Currently around one eighty four. God. Yep. Yep. That'll change as you get older. <laughs> it's changing daily. <laughs> daily. I um, worked for three years in New Orleans. That's a tough town to be in and try and stay fit. Yeah, right. Oh my goodness. And not eat. Who would you like to work with that you haven't so far? There's a lot. Especially when I think about the generation that is sort of, um, you know, the older generation now, the Pacinos and the De Niro's and the Hoffmans and the Gene Hackman um, I, and John Voight. Uh, I, those are all the actors I grew up watching, and I've met many of them, but I've never worked with any of them. Uh, and there's some directors, too, that I really... I'm sorry that I didn't get a chance to work with before they passed, and there's a few that I would still love to have an opportunity to work with. Um, yeah, tons. What do you uh, like doing the most, television or film? Uh, that's a great question, you know, because I, I only wanted to do movies. The, the idea of doing a TV show to me was like the most insane concept. And when they sent me the pilot script for ER, it was a 
two-hour pilot, which was written as a feature script. So I didn't really know it was a TV show until I went into audition for it. And then I figured they'd cancel it, and I'd be on my way to my film career. And then, you know, a funny thing happened. Um, and a funny thing happened on the way was films changed. You know, the f movies are different than they used to be made. You know, you don't find those kinds of character piece movies that those actors I just mentioned made their names and reputations and made anymore. So if you want to play those stories, those are all on TV. And some of the best writers came to TV and some of the best directors came to TV with, the, with pay cable and now streaming. So the game changed a lot. But what I really found is that I like the regularity. I like the lunch pail, blue collar, go to work every day, see the same people, get invested in their lives, become a community, have a spree decor, and build a sense of you know a buy-in. And uh, I, I like that a lot. You know, so I I prefer TV for that. Sometimes it's nice to go off and tell one story, finite period of time, be a hired gun. But I find it more gratifying to. Um, be some part of something that goes on and on and on. I sense from you a real social conscience as well. It's been there. It's growing. It's it's bothered. It's trying to figure out how to voice itself. And like all of us, worried. What's, what's the hardest thing for you about uh, raising a family? In my own personal experience, the hardest thing has been to try to do it from two houses. My my. Uh, first wife and I split up when the kids were six and three and it was the best thing for everybody but it's been a difficult thing to, to manage and uh, as a kid that grew up you know living out of two houses it was something I never really wanted to be a reality for my kids so I do a lot of work to try to augment the fact that that is their reality. Is it hard? Yeah. Do you have kids? No. Oh, well, fuck. I have two dogs. <laughs> you don't know squat, Kometko. No, no. <laughs> you have a dog, too, I know. I've had many. You know, when you're born with the name Noah, it comes with the territory. I am friend of the beast. That's another thing I wanted to ask you about that I saw somewhere, that you like to collect um, bric-a-brac, it was called, associated with Noah's Ark. I did. I occasionally still pick up the odd piece if it's I've, I've gone for quality over quantity now as I've been called a hoarder by more than a few people in my family in my life I'm basically a hoarder with a big enough house that you can't quite tell but I come from a long line of pickers and junkers and pack rats and we have a expression in our family that the line of demarcation between hoarding and taste uh, hoarding and collecting is taste and we fall just on the respectable side <laughs> but barely barely did you know any kids when you were growing up named Noah besides yourself? One one kid in my class in third grade, Noah Shane, he was he didn't last long, but he would sell me his grapefruit roll for fifty cents, my lunch money, every day. Um, no, it was not a very common name, and then I just saw uh, it was announced that Liam and Noah were the two most popular boys' names of last year, which is hilarious to me that that that's true. Did you always like your name? And Colin Jost made a great joke about it on Saturday Night Live. He goes, great, another generation of pussies. <laughs> How do you deal with the world of social media? Barely. Barely arm's reach. But uh, um, you will find when you ask me to promote this how I, uh, how I deal with it. Uh, you know, it makes me tremendously uncomfortable. I see it for its benefits, but I see it for its drawbacks more and uh you know I, I i do as little as i have to 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 promote the things i'm doing and to wish the people who are on social media happy birthdays and happy anniversaries and the things that you do but um i'm basically a very private person and don't like uh self-promotion very much and so it's a whole medium that's geared just towards allowing people in and promoting yourself which has its uh, positive aspects as people should all feel self-empowered but we sort of have developed into a bit of a narcissistic society as, a, as well and I don't see as much um, good works and hope and aspirational qualities to what the messaging could be and uh, I find that troubling. When was the last time you took a selfie? Mm. of myself alone never 
I mean, maybe if I'm, oh, I know. I was. I got this haircut yesterday. I was in the car. And my, I wanted to show it Looks to my good. wife. So I did take a selfie of myself. But I'm, if, I'm not taking a selfie to show anybody where I am <laughs> or what I'm eating or what I'm watching. Because that's all you seem to see on social media anymore is selfies, selfies, selfies. They say, you know, there's that, that line right now that um, if you don't take a picture of it, it didn't happen. My concern is that this thing was sold as a, as a way of establishing who you were in, in terms of personal liberties and taste, where you were saying, this is who I am. These are the things that I think are important and I care about. And I'm hearing more and more that people are, well, it happened in the Trump trial where those jurors were being, you know, they went through their social media and were looking at the things that they had liked and disliked, not just the things that they had posted, but the things that they had commented on. And suddenly they were being held accountable for those preferences in a very different way than was intended. Uh, suddenly you're now identified by the things that you have said that you like. And that is now part of a record that doesn't seem like it's got a lot of leeway for change. And I find that really troubling. All right. Um, Sorry to end it on a downer note. No, no, no. How about another Clooney story? Okay, go he ahead. Took a shit in the cat box. Do you know that one? Yes, I've heard that one. <laughs> I think he told that on the Tonight Show once. Yeah, man. I'll tell you a story about George Clooney. I was walking into the Hollywood YMCA because I would go every morning, uh, and there was this car in the parking lot there. Uh, George loves his cars. It was a black Porsche with a, um, I call it a, a tray on the back you know it had a wing or whatever they call them a spoiler tail whale tail right that's it and uh he came out of the the y and saw me looking at it and he said obnoxious huh <laughs> i said yeah kind of yeah but self-effacing humor yes beat him to the punch yep uh that car was it a convertible I don't know if it was or not i don't remember but it was just he as had, shiny as new and as black as can be there was a night early on in the yard where he and I went to a party together he picked me up in his black Porsche convertible and we'd just been this was in the old days when people would give you free stuff because you were on TV uh, so we had a couple of Hugo Boss suits that they had sent us so we thought we looked pretty sharp and we're in his convertible and we're driving up through the Hollywood Hills and it's kind of a warm summer night and I just thought man this is this and Blues Traveler just cut an album that I can remember it was playing on the radio and uh I said, this is great having a convertible. And then we went to the party, and uh, I had too much to drink. And I had to work the next morning. So uh, somehow I got home, and I got up, and I was at work, and I'm stumbling through it. And George was off, and he comes on to the soundstage. And I said, hey, what are you doing here? And he goes, I got a little present for you, buddy. And he dingles, jangles these keys. And I go outside, and there's a 1960 Oldsmobile convertible Dynamic 88 painted two-tone blue and white. And he goes, I've had this car for 10 years. When uh, I bought it when I was on another show called ER, when I was about your age, and I think you should have it. And he gave me the car right then and there. And uh, I called it the gift that kept on taking <laughs> because, man, I put so much money into that car. You could start it with a Phillips head screwdriver. <laughs> um, but, yeah, it was a very generous gift. I actually ended up auctioning off that car. Somebody paid $20,000 for that car because of its pedigree, and we sent it to the Red Cross just after Hurricane Katrina. Oh, cool. Yeah. Worst or scariest thing to happen on a set? Set on fire twice. You were movies. set on fire? Back-to-back -back movies. My first two movies. Yep. Accidentally, of course. Tell me more. Uh, the first one was a scene where I was burning my father's love letters from his mistress in a bathtub with gasoline. And uh, to get the shot, we put all the letters on a big Ritter fan and doused them with gasoline. And then they turned that Ritter fan upwards and turned it on and aimed it at me. And then they lit it, and this huge wall of fire just kind of came right at me. And uh, stunt guys put me out. And then <laughs> second movie, uh, I was doing a protest at my high school in 1965, Los Angeles, Watts riots. And I'm a young activist student who wants to take on the administration of the high school so I we have a big sentinel soldier monument in the front of the school and I'm going to burn it and I throw gasoline on it and I'm supposed to light it on fire and they put a bunch of rubber cement on it so it would go up and then 
there was a delay, so they were worried they wouldn't go, so they put another coat on it, and then someone went to the bathroom, and then they put another coat on it, and then there was a problem with the camera, and they put another coat on it. Anyway, by the time we finally lit it, it had so much of this uh, flammable stuff on it that it kind of exploded like a bomb instead of going up, and I had all this burning glue all over me. Has there ever been a big role that you wanted that you didn't get? Yeah, tons. Happens all the time. We've talked about a couple of them, actually. Uh, good night and good luck. George offered me a part in that. I couldn't get out of ER to do it. Um, I was offered the part of Private Ryan, Saving Private Ryan. Couldn't get out of ER to do it. Um, there was, you know, a bunch. There was a bunch that, you know, in retrospect, I almost am glad that I didn't do them because, you know, those guys made those parts and had The those things careers. that happen are supposed to happen. Yeah, totally. And I'm trying to remember, uh, uh, Sergeant Private Ryan was uh, Matt Damon, didn't he end up Matt that role? Damon was Private Ryan, yep. Uh, there was two. I got offered the part of Upham, which was Jeremy Davies' part, and he was so phenomenal in that. I couldn't imagine doing anything close to what he did. And then, cause, but that was the run of the film, so then we tried to just make it uh, Private Ryan who comes in at the end. And, um, nope. C'est la vie. Whatever happened to the guy that played Private Ryan anyway? <laughs> Yeah, whatever happened to him. Um, okay, Noah, thanks for stopping by. My pleasure. Still Here Hollywood is a production of the Still Here Network. All things technical run by Justin Zangerly. Theme music by Brian Sanishin. And executive producer is Jim Lichtenstein. <laughs>